Greetings. Thank you so much for joining our session, Mind the People Automating Social Security. My name is Julia Zamokwele. I'm a researcher who's interested um, in the deployment of artificial intelligence and social security. And I'll be joined today by an activist and deputy chairperson of hashtag, um, ha uh, hashtag pay the grants, I beg your pardon. Um, so my interest in this particular case study, what it looks like is really local and, and national. It has global resonance. Uh, we see increasingly uh, on a global scale that governments, um, government agencies, um, and alongside the private sector partners are relying on algorithms to decide who gets public benefit or not. Um, and this research is made possible by Mozilla uh, Foundation, particularly the Mozilla Africa Mradi um, program, which seeks to take a very community focus and grassroots um, um, analysis of uh, the impact of AI on communities. Um, so before I think we jump into the session itself, please allow me to share my screen and give you a bit of more introduction into what the social relief of distress grant is about. So I'll quickly go through the five key points, which I think will do the audience good for those who are not familiar with the social relief of distress grant. It's important to note that the SRD grant is South African government's emergency response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, the government had to act speedily and the speed is um, apparent in the response time. The first case of the COVID-19 pandemic was discovered in South Africa in March 2020, and by May 2020, the SRD system was operational. Secondly, according to the National Income Dynamics Study, um, within less than six months of lockdown in South Africa, a decade's worth um, of jobs was wiped out. Currently, just to indicate the extent of unemployment um, crises in South Africa, the latest figure sits at 33.5%, which is around 8.4 million people who are currently unemployed. But if you look at the broadened um, definition or expanded definition of unemployment, um, that is uh, discouraged job seekers who've given up looking for a job, the, that unemployment figure would go to 42.6%. And also in context of this particular project, which um, the main output is the full length documentary, which is provided in one of the resource links on the page and audience members can watch it um, when they relax and at the time of their inconvenience. That particular documentary, um, we shot the bulk of it in the Northwest province and the Northwest province or district or region in South Africa um, has the highest unemployment rate of a staggering 54.2%. Thirdly, I think we need to give government credit on this part. The SRD grant is open to 18 to 16 year old unemployed South Africans, refugees, asylum seekers, but also other spe spe special permit holders. And the importance of this particular demographic is that ordinarily they would not be able to receive any benefit in terms of a social grant um, because they'd either be considered um, above the age bracket to benefit from the child support grant and also um, you know below the threshold of being able to benefit from a from a pension grant and those who approved for the SRD grant um, are paid 370 rand, which translates to 21 US dollars. Another important aspect of the SRD grant is that it is an online based system application. You know, from application, review, decision, payment, and appeal, it's all online. And as our discussion will show, um, there seems to be systemic problems at each and every stage, which we'll discuss in further detail. 
And then lastly, um, we have, according to the South African Social Security Agency, which is tasked with implementing and administering social grants in South Africa, 8.5 million people are paid the grant each month. But as discussions again will show, is that there's a caveat in that payments are erratic. So 8.5 million people that receive the grant and are deserving of the grant are not always guaranteed to receive the grant the following month. And by way of background, I believe that um, we can start our discussions. Um, Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us um, for this particular discussion. I think it's really exciting and also appropriate to have you join the discussion. Um, when you read the news, um, whether in newspapers, you watch the news, hashtag pay, pay the grants is at the forefront of fighting for the rights of, of a people who are struggling to access the SRD grant. And I think it's important to, to get context and understanding by way of background as to you know, what led to the formation of hashtag pay the grants. Uh, good day, everyone. Um, my name is Elizabeth Reiters, and I'm the Deputy Chairperson of Hashtag Pay the Grants. I also am community-based, so I work with beneficiaries on a daily basis on the ground. So uh, what we as Hashtag Pay the Grants do is we are the middle person between the beneficiaries and SASA. SASA is the Social Development Organization. So we are the ones who solve all the queries of all the beneficiaries. We'll take it to SASA and we'll then take the answers back to, uh, to the beneficiaries. Uh, what started by the grants was after the first, when it was introduced in 2020, after the first year, the government tried to stop it. And that is when uh, Hashtag by the Grants was formed and they actually started fighting for the grant to be continued. Thank you. And I think for the audience, I think it's important to know that Hashtag Pay the Grants is really grassroots focused. Not only are you advocating for beneficiaries or applicants to receive the grant, but it was really started by you yourselves as struggling beneficiaries to receive grants. Uh, yes, uh, to me, we are all beneficiaries, majority of us coordinators from all different provinces, all nine provinces in South Africa. We are all beneficiaries of the SRD grant. So we actually are, we all had issues. And uh, the, some got sorted, but some of us, we are still part of the, uh, the majority of beneficiaries who are getting unfairly declined every month. And, you know, moving from that basis, um, you know, these technology integrated into, for example, services such as um, social security, whether it's the governments that procure and co-design these technologies, um, or also from the vendors, the tech vendors, uh, mostly in the private sector that design and help to administer these technologies. They're marketed as being easy, simple, and empowering. The idea is that you know, the systems will be more efficient, um, people will be empowered because they'll have government at their fingertips, um, so to speak. Um, so from the marketing and the PR at least, it seems as if it's almost perfect but is it you know how is how easy is it for someone for example from the rural areas from townships from um, informal settlements to navigate and interact with the srd system um this is actually one of our biggest points in our court case that we currently have against uh, the government uh, not every beneficiary is technology savvy and unfortunately, the SRD grant is only online. So in order for you to access the grant, you need to have access to a smartphone, first of all. Second of all, you, need, you have to have data. And third of all, you have to be tech savvy because it might sound very easy, 
as the SRT, it's only 370 rand, but it's not easy at all. It's actually a very technical grant. There is so many issues that beneficiaries doesn't even know exist. And this is where we as the grants fit in. And I think it segues nicely into the point around agency and power or power asymmetry. Um, just, you know, from my introductory remarks, I mentioned along the lines of, well, it's meant to be an empowerment tool, right? And often in the field during uh, when I did this particular, you know, uh, community-based interviews for this project, a lot of the language and disposition from applicants or struggling beneficiaries was one of hopelessness um, and sense of belief and yes. not a understanding the desire to understand believe me is there to understand how the process works and how the decisions are made because they're like altering you're dealing with marginalized people who don't know what they're going to eat um you know precarious living positions and the list goes on and on so you're talking to people who have to deal with trying to survive let alone thrive um, so from your experience as struggling beneficiary, but for the thousands of people that look to hashtag pay the grants, um, what would you say on that part around the power asymmetries? Uh, what I would say is that actually the SRD is not actually a grant that beneficiaries can depend on. So you can't really say you have power because you don't know if you're going to starve the one month and, uh, if you're going to receive the grant or if you're going to be declined. Now we have this issue of unfair decline where you get it that beneficiaries, if your family member helps you with a hundred rand towards food for that month, you will definitely be declined that month for your SRD. And I mean, to, the SRD is merely 370 rand. You can, People can't even survive on 370 rand because there's no value in 370 rand currently in South Africa. And I think Elizabeth, you just touched on a, on a policy issue. I know hashtag pay the grants as well as the Institute for Economic Justice and perhaps even the Universal Basic, Basic in Income Grant Coalition have talked about this a lot. When you talk about policy, um, if you look at the definition of income and quite a lot of the feedback that I received was around, well, what is income? Just because I have a certain deposit or credit into my bank account does not mean that it's income. Like you said, I could have borrowed money from somewhere. True, you, uh, this is exactly why we're fighting this in court currently because we do want the government to actually uh, put out what they uh, what is income because you if a family member or friend is helping you or you're selling something in your household maybe so that you can buy food and the money gets transferred how is that income because you're not employed income means that you're employed so if you are not employed and you are supposed to be receiving the SRD how can the government decline you for uh, alternative income source and also, I think worryingly, what I found on the field is that, so for members of the audience who may not know, um, you should be earning per month less than 624 rand. But some applicants or struggling beneficiaries have experienced that even if, you know, what's credited into um, their bank accounts is far below 624 rand, they're still flagged um, for income source and might be declined. Yes, definitely. Uh, if my neighbor, her son lives in KwaZulu Natal, so if he wants to send her money and she doesn't have a bank account because she's an old lady and I'm neighborly and I'm saying you may use my bank account, that is actually excluding me from the SRD on that month. And even if your family supports you, uh, even though the threshold is 624 rand, beneficiaries are actually getting declined for much less 
whether it's a hundred rand, sometimes it's a hundred and fifty rand. Some beneficiaries are not even receiving any money at all. Some beneficiaries don't even have a bank account at all because, as you know, there's uh, two methods of payments. So the one method of payment is the retailers. That is our pick and pay, our shop right, our checkers. That's where retailers, um, beneficiaries can actually go and withdraw the money. Uh, and then you have where you can upload as a method of payment your personal bank account. But now how do you get declined if you don't even have a bank account? Where is Sasa uh, getting this information from? And I think that touches on areas such as trust, such as explainability. I think trust in itself is self-explanatory, but when it comes to explainability of artificial intelligence powered systems, is that especially in this scenario, we're dealing with marginalized people and social security. It should be clear and it should be explained to applicants exactly why at a very granular detail why their application would be unsuccessful true very true but unfortunately uh, our agency sasa is not actually very good in communicating with beneficiaries so beneficiaries basically have no information about the srd grant in actual fact majority beneficiaries don't even understand the uh, srd because it is so technical complicated. And as you know, AI is taking over and I think this is where the decline issue is coming in because it seems there's a group of beneficiaries since 2022, even though the circumstances are still the same, they still getting declined. So we call them like the decline button. We'll say, oh, they're gonna press the decline button. It's like automated system. It's like the names is already there with the ID numbers. It's just waiting for whoever is the staff member to actually press the button. So it's not to actually say that they know what is your financial status. So what I'm picking up from this discussion is that you know, there's automation of social security. Um, and whilst it seems like some of the admin from the implementing agency side may have been reduced, but some of the administrative burdens is shifted to these marginalized um, communities. And at these administrative burdens come in different form. Um, the discussion that we had around ease of use, understanding it, that could be uh, labeled, for example, as learning costs, right? Um, the onus is on you to try to navigate yourself, to learn about the system. And also, I think what pay, hashtag pay the grants has also brought into sharp focus is the burden around financial costs. Mm -hmm. And it seems almost, mm -hmm. you know, counterintuitive, immoral and contradictory mm -hmm. Um, that poor people during the application review process would encounter financial costs. Uh, would you please uh, paint a picture to the audience how that comes about? So we currently have uh, identification verification. This is actually where the beneficiaries actually need to have a smartphone and they must also work a good camera and they must have internet and on top of it as you know majority south africans still have the green id book now unfortunately this is facial recognition so it, uh, if you have the green identity book in south africa uh, south africa currently you can't do the identification verification you need to go and apply for smart card id now, if you're getting a grant of 370 rand and you need to go and apply for a smart card ID, the cost of a smart card ID is 140 rand. That's excluding transport that beneficiaries have to pay to go and apply for the ID. And then again, they must again pay transport money to go and uh, collect the identity document because without that identity document, they cannot do identification verification. And unfortunately in June this year, uh, major, about 
I can say a third of the beneficiaries were blocked. The SASA grants were blocked for identification verification. So up until today, there's some beneficiaries for the past four months that they haven't received the grant. Uh, the accounts is still the grant is still blocked, and they have no means of unblocking unblocking it because they just don't have the funds to go and apply for a smart card ID. So those costs all from a 370 rand. What is the beneficiaries then supposed to eat if they have to spend that money all on applying for the grant? And, you know, still on the idea of costs, uh, perhaps just moving a bit away from financial costs, you also have psychological costs. I'm not sure how the audience feels as they're listening to you speak. Um, my experience in the field uh, opened my, you know, my eyes and touched me deeply. Um, I encountered people who are in distress. It's called, you know, the Social Relief of Distress Grant. Um, and we have to be fair that it works for um, some people, you know, people who have better access to the internet, who know how to um, navigate the way through the application process, et cetera. So it does work. I mean, 8.5 million people receive the grant approximately um, on a monthly basis. But when you're dealing with the majority of, you know, the poorest or the poor in society, you're likely to encounter very large numbers in the majority who don't have um, access to these resources. So I met a lot of distress. Um, you know, some keywords that came up in the field were, you know, anxious or anxiety, um, stress, um, burdensome, um, agitating annoying and there was a sense that it was particularly difficult if not impossible to escape this precarity um, so that was very clear to me and i think with how detailed you're going in with you know the breakdown of experiences of the applicants the struggling beneficiaries that it's a heavy load to carry um, so if you'd please elaborate further on what some of the um, psychological costs are to the applicants. So uh, what's happening here is the emotional damage is very, very bad when it comes to the SRD. The fact that the SRD grant is not permanent, second of all, you it's not like our standard grants in South Africa where you know you are definitely going to receive the grant that month. So if you, I live in a community that the unemployment rate is very, very high and every household here actually, they depend on the social development system in South Africa. And for a mother to come to me and to cry that her kids don't have food because she was declined for that month. And the emotional damage it's it's really bad because it's also because of the uncertainty and also for me it's very stressful because i'm also a beneficiary and i'm also being excluded every month from the grant so i know exactly the feeling but for mother sitting with tears and she doesn't know which way to go it it the emotional damage is very big for the srd grant no, oh, that's true. Um, so Elizabeth, I think what we're also really talking about here is the design of public digital systems and how people experience them um, on a very personal level. But you know, it makes it it's real. That's that's how that's how this plays out. Um, and perhaps just to add light to some audience members is that we're not talking about necessarily a single system. So how the algorithm works is that, you know, um, the applicant would enter their um, the details for review of the application and what you'd have is algorithms interfacing with many um, databases from the private sector and the public sector. And then only thereafter then an automated decision comes about. Um, and what really makes this complex is that there's an apparent struggle in terms of interoperability, right? When you say that a system is interoperable, um, 
we're talking about the ability of computer systems or software the able be, being able to change and exchange information and make use of the information so one of the issues that's really come about and when you're talking about designing of these public digital systems in public and private sector partnerships is the issue of inaccurate databases so you mentioned that the grant um, eligibility checks are done on a monthly basis but it turns out that some of these other databases on which someone's application would be checked against are not necessarily updated on a monthly basis. So you have decisions that are based on incorrect or outdated data. So Elizabeth, my question to you is that from your experience as an activist, from your experience as a struggling beneficiary and when you, you know, inter interface with the different um, beneficiaries that you encounter, what's the sense in terms of how this can be improved? Uh, what I would really think what our Department uh, of Social Development can do is first of all and foremost is to at least double the grant because cost of living currently in South Africa is very high. The grant was introduced in 2020. Then at that time, the grant was 350 rand. This year, April, the grant after three years increased with the 20 rand. Uh, we at least want the grant to be at least just be be below the food poverty line of safe. And the food poverty line for a beneficiary just to get a proper nutrition every day. Uh, the grant should at least be 795 rand, or let's make it around figure 800. Uh, the thing is what the inaccurate databases is, you might have been employed 20 years ago, and you are still on the unemployment database, and that you haven't been removed so you will never ever have access to the srd grant because that database is so outdated and we have asked uh sasa numerous times if they could please go to our labor department and just make sure that these people update their systems and remove the beneficiaries that is actually no more employed it's the same with sars some beneficiaries are also on, on SARS database, yet they are not employed anymore just because they have a tax number. And back to the, you know, the question of trust, I see that we're quickly running out of time, but I'd like to touch on trust. Um, I get the sense from talking with uh, communities nearby uh, who are affected by the SRD grant is that, you know, there's a lack or dearth of trust in not only public sector, but also if you look at the role of other, you know, private sector um, institutions. Yes, definitely beneficiaries really don't trust any department, especially because uh, the rate of fraud is very high in South Africa, especially with identity theft. It's like the current cases we're working on that uh, you find beneficiaries never applied for the SRD grant, but yet it shows that they've already applied. So we do have that happening currently. Uh, the thing is, beneficiaries want the in-person experience. When they want to at least explain their problems, they want that person to person. And I think that's why a lot of beneficiaries like come to my home where I am. I, I actually assist beneficiaries on a daily basis at my home. Like even right now, there's beneficiaries standing by my door waiting for me and I can't believe it. So that is beneficiaries do not trust the government at all. And unfortunately, we've run out of time. It's only a matter of seconds, but I think this discussion brings into focus that whilst we design or governments across the world design these systems for people in mind, these systems need to be rooted in reality. Otherwise, they don't make sense. They, you know, they come up with 
as if they're far removed from um, reality, but also the clarion call is to banks that are involved, to fraud and prevention services that are involved, etc. cetera, um, that perhaps they are bound by a broader social contract. Um, so we need to be mindful and mind the people. On that note, thank you so much, Elizabeth, and thank you for our audience. Thank you, for thank you very me. much, everyone, and thank you for listening.